You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. And in today's show, we're going to get a coffee table conversation with Dr. Rob Stevens of MiningEssentials.com. He's a quarterly guest. He's a trainer uh, for those of us that don't have geological formal training. He trains us in what to look for and understand the basics of geology for these junior mining stock speculations that we speculate in. And today I asked him to come on the show to talk us through what we should look for in geological qualifications. When you're going through a slide deck of a presentation of a junior explorer, you're looking at investing in maybe, what should you be looking for? What should you be looking out for? And uh, Dr. Rob has a PhD. He's been at this for decades. So uh, please take it away. And what are some things we should be looking for? All right, great. Thanks, uh, Bill. And uh, welcome, everybody. Glad to be here again. Um, so yeah, a lot of time I'm, I'm focusing a little bit more on the technical side and trying to explain that, but uh, I think this is a good topic to uh, delve into as well, which is a little bit more about uh, what do we want to look at in terms of the management and directors uh, of, of junior companies uh, in particular. And uh, I think I'll start off with a little bit sort of higher level and then maybe talk a bit more about those technical uh, parts of it. Uh, and just provide uh, some uh, tips or, or things to look at, I think, overall, uh, when it comes to the directors or management of exploration companies. And this would come from uh, my own personal sort of approach or, or experience, but, you know, off uh, over the years, I've chatted with a number of uh, uh, mining analysts and, and others and, and you know, got, grabbed some uh, insight from them about the kind of things that they're looking at as well. So, uh, these are some of the the common uh, features. So, I guess the first thing would say is I, I look at the board and the management um, because they they do have obviously different roles, and it's nice to see uh, who is really uh, you know has that governance role in terms of the the board, but also then who's doing that work and, and really directing the day to day activities uh, of the company. And I like to see a mix. Uh, I mean, I guess that's a bit of a given. So you know, you have a technical background. Uh, you've got uh, business, um, uh, legal, accounting, uh, governance, marketing. Uh, all of those are important uh, uh, skills and, and uh, knowledge that you need to bring to a company. So I do like to see a little bit of a mix, diversity you know, in its own way, so that everybody's not coming with that same background or, or same kind of experience. Um, so what are some key things within that I would look at? So direct experience in mineral exploration. Um, and maybe I'd put that more at the board level than management. Um, you know, you can get a lot of people who uh, have been involved in various venture capital activities, uh, maybe not so much in mineral exploration. Every industry is different. And the nuances of the exploration business are, you know, different than others, including the oil and gas sector. Um, so uh, I like to see that direct experience. And, and even large mining companies, not the same as the juniors. So while that is valuable experience, you also have to have that sort of more entrepreneurial venture capital experience in there as well. Previous success. Now, this is something that, uh, you know, there's often been a lot of conversation about. Um, you know, what we do see is that there are some people who are serial succeeders <laughs> in a way as they have a kind of sixth sense almost when it comes to, um, you know, good properties uh, to acquire those properties. Uh, but I think importantly, they also have the contacts and the relationship that have properties coming to them and also on that business and financing side so they can move those uh, projects forward. So I'd like to see, has there been any past successes? Have they been instrumental in a discovery? Um have they been involved in a, a junior that's been taken over uh, at a premium? Have they taken an exploration project all the way through to mine development? Um, you know, th that kind of range of experience uh, is nice to see. Um, now, recognizing there's a little bit of a, a numbers game. Um, and uh, I saw a conversation with Rick Rule and Ross Beatty, uh, and Ross was kind of talking about uh, getting so many properties in the early part of his career and, and, you know, but some of those panned out and panned out really well. And through that, you know, that built experience for him. So not every project's going to work out, but if you get the good people, you're putting the odds 
uh, on their side. And one thing I will say that I find, if I think about kind of Vancouver area, um, often those people with successes do come with a technical background, but have really moved into more of a business role. Uh, so Ross Beatty, as I mentioned, Bob Quartermain, John Robbins, Ira Thomas, these are all people who, who started with technical backgrounds. So I think that they've got that, that insight. Now, it's not always that way. Uh, Catherine McLeod Seltzer is another person who I think, uh, uh, you know, has been successful uh, without necessarily having a geology or, or engineering background. Um, so, but, it, you know, I think the technical people do have that, that insight that's important. Financial background. So financing, financing is always critical. Um, and, you know, it's always difficult really to get, to get financing. So you want people, and I would say this is kind of at the board level, although for sure in senior management as well, that have those connections, uh, that have been involved in financing that know people, um, within that world that are financing a mineral exploration. And I don't think that necessarily means the large banks, um, you know, it's the brokerage firms, uh, the resource funds and the other types of firms that are, uh, financing uh, exploration activities. Uh, so I think that that's really important. And, and uh, maybe one other part I would just add to that, if they're looking, you know, if this project's moving towards mine development, do they have the mine financing experience? Because that's different than a $5 million private placement or, you know, uh, funding for exploration. Um, when you're moving into mine development, it's more complex. It's much bigger numbers we're talking about. So depending on where the company is at, looking for those different levels of experience. Another one I think is important is in-country experience. <clears throat> um, you know, if you're if you're looking at a project that's in Peru or Tanzania, uh, are there people who are familiar with that jurisdiction? Who uh, ideally, uh, some of those people, especially the senior management, are living there or, uh, and and really know the nuances of the operating culture, let's say, in that particular uh, jurisdiction. Um, and that applies to the technical side as well as the legal side. Um, you know, if you're operating in another country, uh, you're going to have to set up a subsidiary, uh, your ability to permit uh, that project. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be, uh, um, I don't want to necessarily say more challenging, but but uh, I just think of my own jurisdiction here, BC. Uh, if you had never worked here before and just jumped in, you'd be for a big learning curve about how to get that project permitted and move forward. So you want to have that kind of experience uh, under, uh, under your belt. And of course, understanding the risks of that, that jurisdiction. Uh, governance ex experience and, and marketing, I'm kind of lumping those together, although they're quite different. Governance, of course, is critical. I do like to see that on the board that you have people with a good level of governance experience. Um, you know, with the increase in, in uh, coverage and importance of ESG, uh, with G being the governance, uh, you know, that's something people are, are putting more uh, effort into. So you want to see people who have good, solid governance experience. And on the marketing side, I think that's really important too. I had somebody tell me one time that, you know, people sometimes think promotion is a bad word in the junior world. And, and, and his comment was, it's not a bad word. It is a good thing. Over promotion is the problem, and so you got to. But you have to promote your your project and your and what you have and the people that you have. So, I think it's important to have that right level uh, of you know marketing skill in there uh, as well. Um, ability to acquire new projects. So this is a little bit of a catch-all, and I think that goes back to the experience and qualifications of the scene of the board and the senior management um, as. I'm sure most of the listeners know the success rate in expiration is not always that high. It's a challenging business. Um, and so uh, to be honest, I usually get interested in a, in a company, let's say, uh, through a project. You know, they've got a project. I hear about that project. It looks really exciting. Then I kind of look into the, uh, the company a little bit more. But I also realize that even what looks like a really exciting project may not pan out. And with a good team, they have the ability to get new projects. Or even while they're working on one project, they are tapped into a network that could give them access to additional projects. And so I think that that's where that experience, uh, their, their reputation and their network uh, is really important to, to be able to have access. Uh, you know, when companies are wanting to divest of something, they don't just 
you know, put it on Facebook and start marketing it, <laughs> you know, they're going to be strategic about who they're going out to. So you want to be one of those people that that's getting the door knocked on. Um, another one that you can look at, and you see this in the Vancouver area, is that you you get uh, teams or groups of companies. So you have some some senior successful people, uh, and they have a small uh, group of companies underneath of them. Um, and so I think that's good because you're bringing you know that that uh, really qualified people uh, to several companies, and it you know might give you interest in in all of those companies. Um, one of the things that I would say, maybe a couple things there. One is um, how much time is the key? Are the key people focusing on whatever company you might be interested in? Uh, they might have some profile people, but if those people themselves are involved in half a dozen companies and they're chair of this company and you know director of another and a president of a of yet another, you know that their time is going to be split, and that's not necessarily bad. Sometimes just a little bit of time with a great person is is uh you know can be really valuable it's just have your eyes open on that so you know you didn't buy in because you felt this person was really running the company they may be only peripherally providing some management uh experience value as it can be i have certainly seen cases though where you have the right people even if they're not heavily involved in that company and it's time to finance a they may have the intuition to say we should finance now the market's in a good position for that let's do it and they can they can generate those leads and contacts. So even just a little bit of time, as I said, with, with good people uh, is important. The other one that I would watch out for maybe just a little bit is sometimes in these groups of companies, there's a management company underneath that that does all of the work. Um, and that management company then may be owned by the principals of the publicly listed uh, expiration companies. Um, you know, so... Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily a big issue, but it is something, you know, just to to know where your money's going, to know what the compensation is for those senior people and that, you know, they're not uh, kind of dipping into multiple sources of, of uh, compensation for the same <laughs> funds that the, that the junior has. So I just like to know if there's a management company, who owns it, what are they doing, you know, what's their, their role in, in that whole thing. Okay. Uh, one other one, maybe I'll just mention here, and then we'll talk about engineers and geos is ownership level of the company. Um, and I know that that's something you often hear. Some people put a lot of weight on that, that they like a, especially at the board level or president, that they have a fair stock uh, ownership in the company. Uh, so they have a vested interest. If the company's successful, they're successful. And, and I think that's, that is good. I'm not overly fixated on that one, uh, I'll say. Um, I do like it, but I, I don't put any necessarily enormous weight on that one. And one thing I would keep your eye on is that it is possible that uh, uh, individuals may have a high stock ownership, but at what price and when did they get that stock? Uh, if they had significant amounts of pre-IPO stock at a very cheap price, then yes, they may have a, a large share ownership, but very little money. It still means that they have a vested interest, of course, in success, but uh, they may not have actually put a whole lot of their own dollars uh, into that, depending on, on where that stock came. Dr. Rob, if I could interject on that sure. point, yeah. if if uh, a geologist on a team is not motivated uh, by money per se, or the stock or the options that they don't have, do you, do you find, based on your experience in Vancouver and in Canadian markets, that many are motivated by the career success and the recognition that they would get if they're successful with the project? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, if you spend a lot of uh, weeks, months out in the field, um, you know, banging around and looking at rocks, um, you're, you're going to get a pretty vested interest in that. And professionally, of course, um, you know, a geologist that can realistically claim that they were either, key, you know, the key person or part of a small team that led to the success, successful discovery of a new deposit. I mean, that's that's the crowning glory, I guess, for an exploration geologist. Uh, uh, so I would agree. With that being said, people who spend a lot of time in the field, uh, you know, you got to compensate the, those people appropriately. I mean, they're they're away from their homes and families, and uh, uh, they don't, they love that work, but. Don't you think eventually a lot of the geologists get jealous of the finance people who make mul multiples of what they make though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it certainly can be frustrating, right? It's the money people who uh, who do seem to um, uh, do better than others, uh, I would say. Uh, you know, 
it's not easy to see this or notice it, but I do like a company that really respects its technical people. I'm a geologist, so you know, um, of course, I'm. I I feel that, but um, I think that it's really important. Uh, you know, these things are uh, in many ways a marrying between that business expertise and that technical expertise. And if you're just a business company, well, then you're not putting the right effort into what your product really is, which is exploration and discovery. Um, you know, and you could take that to almost any business sector. So, um, yeah, you want to compensate your people properly and and respect them. And um, you know, it's it's good when you go to shows and investors that there's the technical people are there too, not not just the, the business people. It's nice to be able to talk to the guy who's actually seen the rocks in the field, presuming they can talk about it. Uh, <laughs> My advice on that though is because I've gone to PDAC and I go past all the booths. And when I would ask a technical person, okay, so what's your cap structure like? It's like mm. deer in the headlights with some right. of them. They, they could explain the core to me, but they don't even know the cap structure. Right. Yeah. Uh, a very good point. And, and, you know, that was maybe one of the ones I was going to say here around, uh, around geos is that uh, I like to see geos with a business sense. Um, you know, the trouble with some geos is they get really down in the weeds and it's important. I mean, there are detailed technical aspects of the geology. It's, it's complicated. You know, you've got buried deposits that you know very little about. So you really need that technical knowledge and intuition, but you need to know how to put that into a business context without a doubt. Uh, and, and so if, if they're bringing a geo to one of the, to a show like the PDAC, um, maybe that guy needs to take a, you know, keep a, company, keep a finance uh, guy nearby is yeah. what I would suggest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. And you know, one of the things that I like to look at, if I go to the, say, for example, a company's, um, corporate presentation, that sort of thing. And, and, and I do that regularly. It's to be honest, it's almost one of the first things I go to breathe around their website. And then I go to the corporate presentation. Uh, many companies update them quite regularly. So, you know, it's current what, you know, and you get the whole, the whole story, but then I get into the project and uh, you know, if I'm struggling to understand that project and they've got charts and diagrams on there that I'm having to spend way too long to look at, you know, that makes me wonder about whether they have the right business sense in there, or maybe they're missing the marketing people. Um, it shouldn't be the geos who are ultimately creating the, you know, the corporate presentation. They should be feeding into that, but then you need the right people who can, who can disseminate that. Um, so you know, if I gave you a binary choice in light of that, would you choose a finance guy or a geologist to be the head person for an explore co? I guess my bias would be probably a geologist, but I would want to make sure that that person had a good business sense, that they were experienced in the business world, um, that they'd had some business successes, uh, that the president is not out in the field for three months or you know six months. That's not that's not the role of the president at that point or or, or the really senior people, but they need to be hands on and directing that. Um, uh, so I I like to see that that technical person there. So one thing I would just say too, when it comes to looking at those technical people is I wanted to make a comment about the difference between geos and engineers. And so those are really the two groups of, of the technical team exploration company, I'd say. So geologists, they are quite different. Geologists are really the, they're the rocks people, of course, right? And those are the people who are making the discoveries, who understand that geology, who are, who are doing that initial uh, field work and, and you know, hopefully forwarding that discovery. The engineers, they are the developers, builders, and operators. So to me, that they're needed at a, at a slightly different time. Um, and I have seen examples of junior companies that are wanting to move to development and start beefing up their engineering team, but arguably way too far in advance. And so if I see senior management has got four or five engineers and one geo, and they have uh, they're at the preliminary economic assessment stage. That's overweighted on the engineering side. Uh, that's going to be expensive. And, and, and those guys are going to be kind of lost for things to do in a sense. The flip side is if you're at a feasibility study stage or you're really now into mine financing, definitely you have to have that engineering team. And you don't want to wait too late for that. So it is a bit of a balance. But uh, to me, it depends on where the company is at. Um, and really, if you're more at that discovery stage, you want the geos. Now, with that being said, you know you get geological engineers, for example, that can kind of walk both both areas. So, um, you know, just because there's an engineer doesn't mean that they aren't a great exploration 
geologist type person. So you have to kind of look into that a little bit, particularly somebody in the geological engineering world. So um, another thing I would say about the geologists and the technical team that I like to look at is that they have experience in the type of project that the company is is working on. Uh, I mean, I've used this example for me before. I would never be a qualified person in diamonds because it's not an area that I've worked on. It's not where my experience is. Um, I understand it. And and yes, I could go do that. But do I have that sort of deep knowledge that really could make me successful at that? Uh, no. So I, I like to make sure that the, the key people uh, have worked in diamonds or epithermal gold or porphyry copper or whatever it is. And they're bringing that knowledge there. And then likewise, they have the the uh, the jurisdictional experience um, and they know how to operate in that jurisdiction. They know the geology there. Uh, and they know how to move that that project uh, forward. Who's doing all the work? Um, you know, that's one thing I also like to see. Uh, who's doing the field work? Um, and there's a lot of really great, I know here in Vancouver, it's a number of excellent uh, um, consulting companies that will do the field work for you. And, and I think that's great. But what I don't like to see is that really there's kind of no great technical people or or very many in that, board senior management and all the work is contracted out because then there's a gap there. There like where is the company's vision for that project? How are they executing that and and where are those experienced and senior people that are are connecting to the uh you know the the consultants on the ground. So um yeah, so I mean, there's a few things. Um, I'm sure we could go on for a while, but those are kind of some of the the, the key things that that I like to uh, to sort of uh, look at and, and get a, a feel for when when I'm cruising through the junior companies that are out there. When you mentioned groups, and there's pros and cons of these groups that have multiple exploration companies under under them, but they often will have one chief geologist that is kind of overseeing the geological study of all of the different projects. Uh, what's your take on that? You mentioned you're not good with diamonds. You know, should you have an expert in that particular deposit type overseeing, or can you have like one head honcho overseeing the, all of the programs at five different companies at once? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, there are some people who who do have quite a wealth of experience in many different projects. Um, you know, to me, there's maybe a couple of ways of looking at. There's the overall execution approach, uh, the approach to to exploration. Um, you know, planning out your your drill campaign. Uh, to what extent are you going to be trying to expand the deposit versus defining inwards? Those are maybe some of the strategic decisions that a very experienced person uh, can help uh, using almost a business sense to it uh, to advance that project. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, um, but that would relate to this, is you will also see advisory teams. Um, and even in these groups, uh, the individual companies may have an advisory team or even the group of companies will have an advisory team uh, that includes people with some um, that kind of specific knowledge of the different deposit types. So they can draw on that expertise as needed if they're needing to make specific uh, technical decisions while that more um, strategic exploration knowledge uh, by the really successful person um, you know, helps to move that forward. And what I like about those very successful people is, um, you know, they can get financing when they need it. Um, one of their company's projects really kind of fallen off. They've got the network ability for that company to get another project and hopefully, you know, a good one. Um, uh, so I think that that's often where that skill comes in, um, maybe more so than directing you know, the, the day-to-day, -day, certainly then directing the day-to-day -day operations. So when I've gone booth to booth at like a PDAC and I've talked to geologists, uh, sometimes I can sense that, oh, this seems like more of a hobby. And now the investor in me says, I'm not willing to fund your hobby. I am willing to fund your science project if your science project will result in a higher share price. Uh, <laughs> what would you say to me with that perspective? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that comes back to that there's a business at hand, right? And you should be respecting the money that you're, the people's money that you're you're spending. And this is really about making a discovery and moving it forward. Um, you know, geologists will have this, uh, I drilled a hole and it was successful, but you didn't intersect anything of interest. Oh yeah, but it was technically successful. Uh, meaning we wanted to intersect this, you know, volcanic horizon or something like that uh, at 250 meters depth. And we did. Okay. There wasn't any base metal mineralization there that we hoped, but, you know, and, and I don't want to poo poo that too much because it is important. It is a part of building that knowledge of the unknown beneath the surface, but you can find people do a little bit too much of that. Um, I think that sometimes they can get married to a property and they just can't, they can't drop it. Um, I think if you've, kick the can around a few times, maybe it, it's time to move on or you need somebody with fresh eyes on it. Um, so, you know, with that being said, there's lots of great deposits that were discovered on the 50th drill hole. So, <laughs> you know, never say never on that. Uh, but I would agree, you want to be people who are serious about moving this project forward, not just continually testing another anomaly and another anomaly uh, and spending more and more money on something that arguably many people could say, you know, doesn't look like it would be economic anyway or needs a whole new approach. So. so sometimes we see an executive or geologist move from a major company to a junior. Now at the major, they had a nice cushy salary. They had benefits. They had an expense account. They had a nice budget that they could spend without having to worry too much about raising money from investors like me or you. And then they go to a junior. In that scenario, like I've talked to some of those uh, people at conferences and I'm like, I don't know if they get the full mentality of what you know, you have here and an investor like me, if I'm asking myself, do I want to invest in this company? There seems to be a disconnect or a learning curve that they have to go through. Uh, what what insights might you share here? Yeah, I, I, and I agree. I think that the the major mining companies are, are not the same uh, as, as juniors. And I think that to me particularly applies to the engineering staff because my, major mining companies, obviously the core of their business is is operating mines and doing that you know, as best they can. And that is more than anything, an engineering um, activity. Uh, then you take that into a junior where now you really aren't doing any engineering. You're doing all geoscience and and needing that that mentality of discovery. And so, you can be tempted to spend like a drunken sailor too, I think. Yeah. If, if yeah. you're used to the, just the funds always being there. No, that's right. Well, I mean, one of the things we didn't mention is burn rate, uh, you know, when it comes to compensation and that sort of thing, and even what they're spending on marketing or, or other things, I like to see, uh, it's not always so easy to, to, to exactly figure that out, but you know, how much is going into the ground? And that's really what you want to see. Now, I don't get too carried away from that because as we mentioned, you need marketing and other things, but you want to see a lot of that going into the ground. Um, so, but, but that being said, there's, there are, you know, many good experienced, uh, um, uh, you know, those who have come out of the, the major mining companies who are entrepreneurial in their, in their blood kind of thing. And that's probably why they left to some degree. It can be frustrating and a bit stifling, uh, in those larger companies that may not have that same entrepreneurial environment. And so, uh, they've taken advantage of all the things they've uh, learned and the mentors that they've been able to get out of a major company and and bring that uh, into the junior. So I, I do think there's some good successes there, but they probably need a good business partner right, to make sure that they're keeping on track with the level of or the type of company they're involved with now. Dr. Rob, your book is the first uh, really good book that I read in, in the sector about geology that I could understand as a non-geologist. It was recommended to me by a CFO of a cobalt company back in 2017 or 2018, I forget. And so I, I read it since then. I recommend it to people all throughout the year when people ask me, Bill, what should I start with? I give them your book. Remind listeners what your book's about and also your website, miningessentials.com. Yeah, sure. Great. Thanks, uh, Bill. So uh, the book is called Mineral Exploration and Mining Essentials, and it was really designed for uh, those non-technical people, the, the non-geologists and non-engineers who are working, invested, involved in the mineral exploration and mining industry, and really want to know some of those technical pieces. And so it was really written uh, with the aim of explaining, you know, somewhat complex topics as as, as simply as possible. And I really look at, uh, I liken it to a story. 
Uh, it's a very exciting industry to me and involves so many capa- uh, so many facets. And, and that book is really kind of the story of the mineral exploration and mining industry uh, from discovery through to closure of, uh, of a mine site. And, and so um, I think uh, many of your listeners would find it engaging. And um, if you go to miningessentials.com, uh, you can find some information on there. You can get a free book sample. Uh, it is for sale on Amazon in the U.S., Amazon.com. Uh, globally and in the U.S. through uh, Amazon.com, as well as Amazon CA and Amazon uh, in Australia. Uh, I also have some online uh, courses for those who want to dig a little bit deeper uh, that kind of step through the book uh, and, and you know help explain some of those aspects of it. So thanks for that, Bill. I appreciate it. Yes, excellent. And I will link to that website in the show notes. Dr. Rob, thanks for coming on. And we'll bring you back on in about uh, three months to talk through a different topic. Sounds great. Thanks very much, Bill. And take care, everyone. 